Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Alan Young and I am the UK Marketing Manager here at Axios Systems. Uh, we have a global audience on the webinar today and I just want to take the quick opportunity to personally thank you all for giving up your valuable time to participate. Uh, you have all chosen to attend the webinar to understand more about the Bermuda Triangle of SAM and the benefits of adopting an integrated approach to the tools and processes required to manage your assets. On the webinar, we have Laura Hare. Laura Hare is a product manager here at Axios. She will set the scene from a high-level business perspective and put some context around the partnership between both ITSM and SAM. We also have Rory Canavan. Rory is the founding consultant and owner of SAM Charter, a consulting practice that specializes in creating and maintaining ITAM and SAM processes. Interestingly, he is also a member of the Working 21 group. This is an ISO group established to create and promote ISO standards relating to IT asset, ma asset management. Rory will go on to explain the detail behind the Bermuda Triangle of SAM and offer some practical advice on how to manage this within your own organization. Last but by no means least, we have Ed Perez. Ed is a business solution consultant at Axios. Um, Ed will complete the webinar by demonstrating a common journey we see at Axios in preparing for vendor audits. Before we get started with Laura's presentation, I'd like to take a, 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 quick, a quick survey of, of the people on the call. And this is really around understanding your organization's maturity level. We'd like to rate your organization uh, some uh, maturity level based on these uh, pillars we have here. So basic, which is around ad hoc, little control over IT assets being used everywhere. Moving up to standardized, which is, a, which is a SAM process that exists, as well as tools and data repository. Rationalized SAM, uh, you have vision, policies, procedures, and tools that are used to manage software asset lifecycle. Or you're right at the top of the tree, dynamic SAM, where there's real-time alignment between, between the, 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 the uh, changing business needs. So what I'd like to do right now is just to launch the poll. And if you could take a couple of seconds just to complete those questions. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you very much for taking part. Interesting, we also have a free SA online SAM assessment tool within the organization, which we will make available to the audience um, and the link later on uh, during our follow up. I now would like to hand over to, to Laura. Laura is going to start off the webinar presentation and talk about the key partnerships we see between ITSM and SAM. Laura, over to you. Thanks, Alan. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us today for the webinar. My name is Laura Hare. I'm a product manager at Axios Systems. My primary responsibility is to drive the development of new and enhanced functionality for IT operations product suite. So this suite uh, covers a broad range of capabilities from device discovery, automation, software asset management, and performance monitoring. So before we hear from Rory, uh, I'd like to talk about the partnership between IT service management and SAM. Most of you probably know Axios from the IT service management space. We've been around for uh, 30 years. Highlighted in red, you can see the IT service management capabilities we offer in our solution. But bear in mind, Axios can also help you with IT business management and IT operations management, which is highlighted on the right-hand side with the green circle. So like our customers and industry analysts, we recognize the need for tight integration between IT infrastructure and the services, the business services rather, that they underpin. This is what really led us to expand our product portfolio into not just device discovery, but all the other capabilities you can see in, in the purple here. So moving on, let's have a quick look at the, the challenges for CIOs today. So these are common IT challenges. As you know, the, the world of IT is changing continuously. Um, these are, I suppose, the top challenges uh, identified by CIO Weekly. And what I want to do is really just talk through each of these challenges, what they mean, and, and how you can overcome them in the context of SAM. So let's start off with the, with the biggest challenge, is really about going faster. So IT are expected to spin up 
core systems um, a lot quicker nowadays, given very little notice. They need to deliver new systems and new innovations with shorter and shorter timelines. This can be very challenging when you don't have any automation. The next challenge is all about going digital. So, you know, with the external and internal business user interactions becoming more complex, it's very difficult for organizations to stay ahead of this. A lot of end users are really expecting a quicker and more automated service. So it's very easy to be left behind and uh, you know, become stagnant in this area. The next challenge is all about being secure. This is all about maximizing your security and minimizing the risk. As you know, the risk to IC, uh, IT security is, uh, has never been greater. So it's really important to keep these things at the forefront. Uh, you might recall there was quite a few examples last year, actually. Um, I'm sure everybody remembers the WannaCry ransomware and also the Equifax data breach. So these are just a few of many examples that we're seeing today with big organizations who have failed to protect their, their IT assets and their data. The next challenge is all about breaking the 80-20 rule. So what this really means is about um, 80% of the IT budget is typically spent on the day-to-day -day running costs, and only 20% of that is about delivering innovations. So this is challenging because according to Gartner, budgets are going to be flat again, so it's going to be even more difficult for organizations to break this cycle. So what's stopping you? So if we frame these challenges within the context of SAM, what does it mean for you? Well, you have to help the CIO but you can't go faster with manual software deployments and the growing complexity of various operating systems and software suites. The challenge of going digital, well, you need to try and fit into the digital transformation. And without proper tools and processes, you'll miss users' expectations. As I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, end users are really expecting the Amazon-type shopping experience. So they can go to a self-service portal, request the software they need, to do their job, and this should be automated and delivered the same day or even the next day. We also have to try and balance this. Um, so users obviously want to install their own software, but we have to be careful that it's approved, they're not installing any malware, and also securing the devices. And that's all really about knowing what you've got, and then obviously secure it. If you don't know what's out there, you can't secure it. As I mentioned before, the challenge of breaking the 80-20 rule. So you have to meet all these objectives with a minimum, uh, minimal budget. So you need to have some sort of cost-effective automation in place. So let's look at the benefits of business management and SAM. So first of all, um, it's really about reducing costs. And this is all about knowing what you've got and aligning purchases with business demand. So you've obviously got much more visibility when you know what's out there and can forecast to accommodate any new projects in the pipeline and avoid any unnecessary purchases. You can maximize what you've got and make the most from your investments. Next, reducing risk. And this is about things like avoiding license fines. So being a lot more proactive and managing your, your software and hardware assets. And Ed will uh, talk to us about that a little later on. Um, you also want to secure your assets, as I mentioned, and avoiding breaches. So knowing what's out there, making sure it's all patched, your devices and endpoints are all locked down and secured. Last but not least, is, it's also about improving service. So once you know what's out there, you can manage it and really understand what infrastructure is required to deliver your key business services. Once you're in that position, you can ensure that devices are up and maintained and patched, ensure you know, the, the biggest amount of uh, uptime available as possible to minimize the outages. You're going out to finding all, all your hardware and software assets. This is important because this data is very, very valuable to IT service management. It underpins all your incident, problem, and change processes. So what are the companies? Well, as an organization, you need the right people. 
So these are people with the right skill set and expertise. It might not necessarily be people in your own organization. A lot of our customers may look to consultants for um, expertise for example. It's all about having the right people to understand the particular challenges. It's also about changing mindsets and attitudes. For example, many of our customers may have granted users access to install whatever software they like. Obviously, they need to change that and control that. And it's really about explaining the reasoning behind that. So it's a shift or a change in process that sometimes can upset end users unless you communicate the, the, the reasons for doing so. Um, you've also got to think about the tools. So whether you've got no tools or too many, um, sometimes you may have old tools that are no longer fit for purpose. It's really making sure that the tool set you have aligns to your requirements. Then, last but not least, you need to look at processes. And these are really important because you, you really need all three of these areas um, to be working. You need to sure you make sure you've got policies and processes in place and that they're also aligned to your tool set as well. And any changes um, that you make, continual service improvement, that they're also um, adopted. So this is actually a very good, um, I suppose, chance to hand over to Rory now. Uh, Rory's going to talk a lot about this, the SAM Bermuda Triangle and the SAM processes. So I'll hand over to you, Rory. Thank you, Laura. Thanks for that. So um, hello, everyone, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to tune in today. Um, we hope uh, to highlight a particular use case in software asset management that I like to refer to as the Bermuda Triangle of SAM. So just to uh, quickly uh, run through by way of introduction what we're going to talk about today. Um, what is that Bermuda Triangle of SAM? What is it comprised of? And as we can see here, it's concerning the request of software, the procurement of software, and the deployment of software. Um, Unfortunately, we won't be able to talk about the 123 of BAU SAM. Perhaps we can save that for another webinar and, uh, and then we'll have a quick wrap up as well. So what is the Bermuda Triangle of SAM? Well, let's, let's take this particular use case and perhaps you might be able to see some of this in your organization, um, certainly around programs or projects, um, perhaps even in business as usual. So we've got, if we can imagine, a uh, project manager and that project manager has been charged with standing up a particular service in the business. And that service is going to make the company a lot of money. Now, that service in this day and age is typically backed up by a technology stack comprised of hardware and software. Um, but being, shall we say, commercially driven, our project manager doesn't want to go through the, uh, the humdrum of business as usual processes. Uh, and he has his own budget. So um, we'll just get his project director or program director to rubber stamp a request for the software that will fulfill the technology stack um, and then follow ITIL best practice and actually split that request between procurement and between deployment there to save time. Now, 20 years ago, that might have been applicable because we don't actually want to wait for a receipt from a software vendor to say it's okay to install software because anything approaching um, OLAs or SLAs in regards to delivery of software would be out the window then at that point. So um, at the time, it might have been appropriate to do that. But in this day and age, we instantiate licenses from the raising of a purchase order. So perhaps there is grounds there to think that actually we don't need to split requests to save time. So let's focus on procurement. So procurement, um, again, if we follow a worst case or a bad case scenario, we'll probably do nothing more than actually see that the project uh, or the budget holder for the project isn't exceeding uh, their budget for the expenditure on the overall project and say, if that's the software you want, that's fine, away you go, and actually make a purchase. And um, because deployment actually want to be in and, and good friends with the project manager, he might be a bit of a boy, um, they'll actually think, right, okay, well, we've got this software that's been requested. We've already got it packaged. The particular problem here is that what's requested may not be what's bought and what's bought may not be what's installed. And there's no sense of due diligence between the three processes. So let's follow that, uh, this scenario to its conclusion. Six months down the line, 
the services stood up, the business is making a lot of money, and a software vendor calls. The project manager has rolled on to a new project, procurement can't remember what they bought last week, never mind six months ago, and deployment by and large are in the same situation. They don't know what they deployed last week, never mind probably six months ago. There's a lot of scurrying around. Because there's no cohesion, a lot of money is being wasted, a lot of software is being over-deployed or misdeployed, and equally, architecturally, it may not be assessed at the point of deployment. And this creates then the perfect uh, storm for a software vendor audit, hence the, uh, the Bermuda Triangle of SAM. So what can we do to actually try and mitigate these risks? Um, just before we dive into the actual processes, I, I should say that these have been modeled and are templated in a, in a modeling language called ARIS, and I'll just take you through what some of the shapes mean uh, so that when they come on the screen, um, it doesn't leave you scratching your heads. Um, we've got a trigger or, or an event that takes place which requires action upon. This is our manual function step, so it should go left, right, left, right, then between the trigger and the manual function step then. We have a supporting document in place, so if, if in the action, in the function step, we have to require uh, documentation to complete the function step, we refer to that. We have who is actually completing the role. So we have a job role or a department referenced into the function step. Then we have an application. So we might be calling upon a piece of software to complete the function step, and then we have data. Now, we can model risk. We haven't in this example. Again, if we're getting into high-end SAM and SAM process engineering, we should have a QA checkpoint, because if we want to reinforce KPIs, we need to be measuring data to measure process performance. And then one thing we want to make sure is that when we have this Bermuda Triangle of SAM scenario in place, that these processes don't act in isolation, that they actually um, sort of transfer activity and, um, and they work well together and they talk and they communicate. So we've got a, a shape there representing a process interface. And all of this now will hopefully come into, um, uh, come into practice or, or, or demonstration shortly. So what are we looking to um, capture when we actually create a request process in terms of best practice? We should be looking to, in some way, have line management approval, formal line, line management approval. It's not just a case of a, uh, you know, a spreadsheet with a list of software or a post-it note on a desk. Uh, we should be having a, a structured approach there to actually requesting software. Some sort of IT due diligence to make sure that the software requested does actually meet um, the approval of IT, because it could be from a network or a security or a service management requirement that we can't actually approve software. We also want to conduct a license pool check because the last thing we should actually be doing is making sure uh, or, or just rubber stamping requests through and saying, yeah, it's fine, IT have approved it, the line manager says it's okay, bump, away you go, buy your software. It could be the software's already owned by the company. So this is the, uh, the process we have for a software request process. Um, at 1.10 here, we make the software request, the end user makes the request, and they consult um, a supported software catalog. And this is vital, because this is the declaration by SAM to say, this is the list of software we say needs to be in place to run the organization. So that should be, in, in the first instance, the list of software that's presented to end users. We then step along and the next step that takes place is the line manager actually verifies whether or not the software can or cannot be approved. Um, they, that line manager has two options, either the request is to be rejected or it's to be approved. Now brace yourself guys, because this is the next slide that makes people go, wow. Um, if we carry on from page A here, we can actually reject the software request and then um, that that particular matter is closed and the user is, is informed as to why the software should actually be rejected or why the request was rejected. If the um, line manager approves the request, then we can go along to the help desk or the service desk and actually do what we call SSC validation. So we, don't, we want to make sure that perhaps um, 
the end user hasn't sort of circumvented the um, software supported software catalog and has actually um, picked something from the list. If for some reason um, the end user has picked something that's already been rejected, then we can hand off to the reject activity up here. If they've requested something that perhaps isn't on the list, because we've got to be a, a demonstrated degree of flexibility, um, but we do actually want to um, consider whether it could be added to the list, then we can hand back to a software testing process here. Finally then, um, if we approve the software, we can actually conduct that licensing pool check then at that point. Now, if the software um, is in place, we can then hand off to a software change management process, or perhaps if it's an as a service title, we can go to BYOD, a BYOD process, because we want to make sure that any platform that's engaged with is fit for purpose. If the company's bought it, fine. If the end user has brought in their own kit, then perhaps we want to validate that from a security point of view or a fitness to actually host the software. Um, and then if we don't have the software in place, then we can hand off to a, a software procurement process. From a procurement point of view, what are the best practices that we actually want to be checking? We want to make sure that the request has come through official or authorized channels, because again, we don't want to get into that scenario where a nod and a wink and a post-it note is left on a, on a desk and would you mind doing me a favor? We just need to buy this software. We also want to conduct our own validation and due diligence around making sure that the um, software is actually on the supported software catalog as well. So we're not sort of um, hoodwinked into buying something that shouldn't actually be approved from an IT point of view, but also perhaps do some sort of vendor validation as well to make sure that we've got a contract in place to support the purchase. And finally, of course, we need to make sure that people aren't exceeding budgets if, uh, if budgetary concerns are, are an issue there. So just let me tap dance for the moment because um, I don't appear to be able to get the next slide on the go. Okay, um, Alan, are you able to help here? I, I appear to be stuck. Yeah, sure, hold on. Thank you. Try now. Okay, no, it's saying control by Ed, so I think. Uh... Try now. Okay, there we are, I think we're back. Okay, thank you. So off the back two of our financial and budgetary um, validation, it could be that if we hit a certain limit, do we want to pass off to an invitation to tender process as well, because um, we want to get the best possible value through competition and actually bidding for, for a software purchase. Okay. Okay, there we go. Forgive me, guys. We're just um, experiencing a slight lag on the presentation. So having come in from a software request process then, um, procurement go through their due diligence checks with the software request. So we've checked, we can compare against a contracts database or a vendor database, and again, the supported software catalog to make sure that we're dealing with the right vendor, um, that we've got a contract in place, and that perhaps that the software is actually approved by IT in the first place. Uh, and if there are any other sort of procurement checklists in place, then we can actually uh, import these through through data here. Um, if there is a requirement because of spend or because of, of importance to the business that we actually go to a tender process, then we can pass off to a, a tender activity here. Um, if for any reason the request actually fails procurement due diligence checks, then we can hand back to the software request process and we can close down the request through that loop there, through that workflow. 
If then at that point though, all the checks are passed, then we can actually go ahead and procure the software. So it looks like this is a relatively straightforward and short, short process. Um, one thing that, that perhaps these symbols don't allude to is the amount of time and effort that actually takes place to actually do the due diligence checks or actually go to a, an invitation to tender process. Um, but we've got one more step here, and that is then actually to take that purchase order and, and give Sam the opportunity to turn that into a, um, uh, into, into a license then at that point and instantiate a license from the purchase order and we hand off to an entitlement importation process. So from a deployment point of view, or I think I'd possibly call it a change management perspective on, on, the, uh, on the slide deck uh, moving forward, what other aspects are we looking to, to ensure are enshrined to make sure that we've, we've mitigated risk around deployment? So again, we want to make sure that we, we validate the authenticity of the request that it's come through um, authorized channels. It's not just a quick email saying, please install X, Y, or Z. We want to conduct some sort of architectural validation as well. So it could be that we bought a license for an on-site piece of software, and then somebody says, wouldn't it be a great idea to virtualize this? Um, virtualization is very much a privilege, uh, not a right, and it's a privilege that you pay for. We want to make sure there's some proof of entitlement existence. So um, we, we could go down that sort of old fashioned ITIL route and wait for the proof of entitlement to rock up later. Um, again, it's, it's a horses for courses um, judgment that you might want to make in that as to whether you feel that you've got a, a robust enough system and process interaction in place to say that actually we're prepared to wait a day or two um, uh, and then, then we can chase up the entitlement. And then we wanted to conduct some sort of quality assurance as well, because it could be if we're just requesting an installation for one or two instances, then that's fine. But if we're talking a rollout across an entire company, we want to make sure that we've rolled it out to the exact number of devices and no more. And if for any reason there is a problem, we want to have some sort of a rollback plan in place. So straight out of the box then, um, this is where we conduct our validation check. So this will be the architectural check and the, also the authenticity um, uh, request uh, check that actually takes place here. In this particular model, we've got the SAM manager doing this. It could well indeed be um, head of ops or, or service management doing it. Again, that's, that's the joy of consultancy and actually um, tailoring it to your own requirements. Um, if the software has not been tested for any reason and it somehow makes it through to the change management process, then we can hand off to the test process here to see that that takes place. Um, if there is no license or proof of entitlement to justify the change, then we hand back to the request process to potentially close it down or go through a testing process or a procurement activity if somehow that hasn't been um, actioned. Um, but if our architectural and validation check um, is, is suitable in all respects, then we can pass on to page B. So sorry, I should say, yeah, we've got the, the technical and business assessment check here as opposed to the, the, excuse me, to the check in the first page, which looked to author, authenticate the request. Um, again, if for any reason the, um, architecturally the the check or sorry the, the the proposed change or the installation of the software needs to be rejected then we can go back to the software request process and reject it through that way because it could be that something's cropped up between the request and the actual implementation a change in the design that hasn't been factored to suit the license that's been purchased this is the green light essentially. So at 1.30, we look to say, yes, okay, we're suitable in all respects to make the software installation or the change. Let's go ahead and do that. And then we make our software deployment change. Having made that change, we then conduct our quality assurance check. So we might sort of look to validate then that the uh, right number of users have the, uh, the, right, you know, the right level of access. Um, that it's been the software has been delivered to the right number of machines and to the right area of machines as well. There's no point in installing software to 75 devices in the UK when they needed to be in Germany. Mm -hmm. 
Now we'll just conduct the uh, uh, the, the 1.70 activity here. If, if from a quality assurance perspective everything is fine and everything is happy, um, then we can go to perhaps to an end user um, acceptance trial process. If this is a new bit of software, we want to make sure that the end user is happy in all respects. Um, if we do have a change which requires leased equipment to go back to the people we've leased it from, then it could be that we actually hand off to a hardware disposal process and take care of that, that re-imaging exercise back to the hardware disposal activity. If for any reason we have a problem around deployment or, or change failure, then we've got two options. Either we can instigate the rollback plan you know, this, this change is more trouble than it's worth and we don't want to go there. Um, let's, uh, let's go back to where we were before. Then we can go to page E. If for any reason we've got a software change that's to be repaired or updated, then we can go to page F. So page E, this is essentially a while do loop. We instigate the rollback plan. We then conduct a rollback plan review. And we keep going until such time as the rollback plan is, is actually successful. Obviously, this is a template, so you would then instigate a, a, a breakout point to say at some point, actually, we've done this three times. We're not going to do it a fourth. Let's, let's just give it up as a bad job. But if the rollback plan does work, then we can communicate that to the, uh, the end users. For the change repair plan as well, then it's essentially the same activity, but slightly different wording. Um, we, we review the, uh, the repair plan to see how it's actually affected. Has it, has it improved or got us to an acceptable state? And we keep going until that point, we reach that point where we say we have, or we settle actually on, um, on, on a given state. And then we can communicate that change to the stakeholders to say that, yes, you're, you're good to go. You can, you can carry on using the software. So in summary, I would say that inter-process communication is vital. I hope you, you got the value and importance of actually having those processes connecting and talking to each other. Also systems integration. So one thing we've, we've talked about there is very much a workflow. We've referred to the systems that are actually used, but it could be that you want to speed data between systems. And so that's going to require connectors and um, making sure that systems have permissions to talk to each other. And that's, that's a whole other topic around automation that we can, we can perhaps engage in at the time. Um, should say too, that if you want um, um, guidance or, or help around uh, Sam, or you want access to any of those goodies, you're more than welcome to go to the samcharter.com page and, and raid the downloads page there. There's also a white papers page as well. We, we pretty much do nothing but Sam on, on the Sam Charter page, so you're more than welcome to that. Um, and then if the, um, the processes that you've seen modeled are of interest to you and you'd like to take those kind of forward in your own organization, we do have a sort of a getting started kit that uh, is available for sale there too. Um, as ever, if you have any questions, um, I appreciate, I've been on many of these things where you think I must ask the person the following question, and then I only remember it 10 minutes after the presentation is finished. Um, I'm all about LinkedIn, or please email me, it'd be great to hear from you. So I think at that point... Fantastic, Rory, thank you very much for that, uh, great insight. Um, on the Point of questions, actually. Um, I've been monitoring the, the uh, chat that's come through while you've been presenting your slides, and there's a, some questions that have come through. We can't do all of them, unfortunately, but there's a couple that you might be interested in. Is it okay to answer a couple of questions? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Sure. So the first question is, uh, you mentioned that the process maps are templated in nature. Is there anything you would change about them since they were first created? Oh, good question. Okay, so... Um, one of the things what since I created the software request process that, that has come to light increasingly there's this I think this concept called shift left um, where we talk about um, sort of self-service and, and greasing the wheels and, and um, keeping the client happy wherever possible. One thing I think off the back of the software request process um, that hasn't really factored into anything resembling um, as, as Laura uh, alluded to in her portion of the presentation self-service. So um, one thing I would look to do is to have some sort of a breakout for if, if any software on the supported software catalog doesn't require the sense of due diligence to um, put in an install 
so your um, you know your desktop readers your PDF readers that kind of thing and, and Skype and whatnot and what else um, just go ahead and help yourself there's no sort of workflow activity around around that kind of activity which I'd like to see in place okay Nice one. Um, um, one more, and uh, just keep us on track. Um, apart from what you've already mentioned, are there any other processes key to SAM? Uh, oh yeah. Well, I, <laughs> I've done a book of at least 23 of them, but um, just off the top of my head, in terms of um, of importance, I would absolutely say your recycling process. Um, in fact, I would go so far as to say you can have a recycling process ahead of your SAM program. You don't um, necessarily need to wait until uh, you generate an effective license position before you start recycling. Um, you've got bigger fish or concerns to fry from an IT perspective than satisfying a compliance report. If you wait until the generation of an ELP to decide whether or not you remove software, you are playing into the software vendor's hands, so don't do it. Cool, fantastic. Okay, um, so you, um, for the benefit of all the uh, people on the call, all, um, this webinar is going to be available on demand and um, so if you've missed any of the contact details that Rory provided or uh, any of the questions or any of the, the people that joined a little bit later on some of the slides at the start of his presentation there will be an on-demand version so never fear you'll, you'll get the full the full um, webinar um, in your in inbox and um, so just to complete the, um, the webinar I'm going to pass over to Ed Perez and Ed Perez is going to take us through a, a use case that we see, often see at Axios Systems when we work with our customers and it's all around vendor license audits. Ed, can I hand over to you? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you, Alan. So what we're going to do is we're going to switch gears just a bit from the discussions we just had with Worry around the Bermuda Triangle of software asset management. And we're gonna focus on vendor license audits. And this is an area that we see a lot of exposure today with a lot of organizations. So what we're gonna talk about first off is we're going to discuss how, what we're seeing out there in the market. And um, Alan, I, I seem to not have control. Could you, perfect, thank you. So what are some of the things that we're seeing out there in, in the world today? that clients are being faced with. And what you're looking at right now are three important numbers to keep in mind. And these are numbers that have been provided to us by analysts. And, and the first number is 68%. So when we say 68%, what does that number actually relate to? Well, it's the likelihood of being audited at least two or more times. That's 68%. The next number I wanna focus on is the number all the way to the right, the number seven. And that really equates to the average time it takes to complete an audit today. Seven months, that's a pretty long time when you think about it. And the most important number is the number in the, in the center, that $100,000. And what does that equate to? That is the average cost of an audit. Now, when I say the average cost of, the, of an audit, that's the practice to perform the audit. It doesn't talk about the outcome of the audit. So if the outcome of the audit means that you need to purchase additional licenses or even penalties, that's above and beyond that $100,000. So when we talk about these numbers, would they really equate to, you know, what is causing these numbers to, to be hitting us in today's world and probably first and foremost is unprepared a lot of organizations today are unprepared to address these license audits and the reason for that is they're just too busy struggling to manage their infrastructure so when we talk about you know prepare for an audit there's a lot of components that need to be in place you have to have the data that's required to prepare for these audits, and they're all over the map. You have asset data, you have purchase data, you have contract data, license data, just to name a few. And on top of that, there's a lot of discovery tools out there. So a lot of organizations don't really mandate or structure on one discovery tool, they'll have a few. And in addition to these discovery tools, a lot are still the reliant on things like Excel spreadsheets. So even if you have all that information tracked, what about the complexity of license models from these different vendors? 
they don't make it really easy for us to, to manage and understand. You have cow license definitions, you have user, you have site, you have core. So there's a lot of different license definition models out there in the market today. And on top of that, they're ever changing. So what can we do to be audit ready and continuously compliant? Well, if you can have all that information in a single place, that would be one good start, right? So if I can, I can optimize all my licenses and reduce overspending, imagine if I can do all of that and then I can apply some intelligent rules to automate the license reconciliation, automate the data gathering, and really make sense of all this information. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to go on what we call a journey. And I utilize ASSIST to prepare me for these vendor license audits. What are the capabilities within ASSIST to address that? Well, first and foremost, the first stop on this journey is realizing what you have installed. If any organization has gone through software asset management or preparing for a license audit, really, you're only as good as the information you have installed within your organization. You need to realize what's out there, whether it's sitting on a Windows platform, Linux, Unix, you have to have the proper discovery tool to address that. And then once you've gathered all that information, we need to normalize it, step two. Now, when I talk about normalization, a lot of times organizations see end users renaming the software that's sitting on their desktop. So Bob may be calling it Microsoft Office, Tony may be calling it MS Office, or Mary might be calling it Office 2012. So even though they have all these naming conventions that they put in place, once I do my discovery, I need to normalize that data. I need to process that data through a normalization engine and compare that to a software library and present that information to my software asset managers. And then the next stop on this journey is step number three, reconcile all that information, right? So I've discovered it, I've normalized it. Now I need to reconcile it. And how do I do that? I need to bring in license agreements. I need to bring in purchase or have a proper understanding of my license definitions. Without that, I really can't reconcile the data. But with Assist, we'll show you how. The next stop on this journey is going to be audit ready. Generate the reports that I can hand over to those vendors when they come knocking on the door for a vendor audit. So if you have this information in your back pocket, you're 100% prepared and audit ready. Then lastly on today's journey is gonna be stop number five. I've done all this great data gathering, normalization, reconciliation. Now, let me optimize what I have. So if I know that I have purchased maybe 50 licenses of a particular software, but during discovery, I noticed that I have 60 licenses out there, well, I'm not compliant, so maybe I need to start optimizing what I have. Maybe remove from Tom and give to Mary, right? Or um, maybe I need to go out there and repurchase some additional licenses. I need to optimize what I have. So with Assist, how can I do that? Let's take a look. Well, stop number one, the what's installed. With Assist, we give you a graphical representation of what you have. We give you a high-level dashboard with great widgets that give you all this information from your discovery. And our dashboards give you the capability that I can go out there and maybe export that information. And I can export the information from that particular widget in any format I like, whether it be PDF, a CSV, any, any way I like. In addition to that, I can resize these widgets. I can move them around anywhere within the dashboard. Whatever is most easiest for me to consume this information is available with Assist. Well, let's take it another layer, right? I have a nice dashboard view 
wouldn't it be great if I had a list view? And with this list view that's provided by Assist, we give you all the rich information that a software asset manager is so hungry for. So we give you the host information. We give you the status by operating system, by discovery um, um, protocol used to gather the information, whether it's WMI, whether it's SNMP, whether it's uh, a shell script. Also, we give you the user, right? Who is the user on that device? In addition to inventory, discovery, and more. Also great, filtering capabilities and displaying capabilities. But if I need to provide this information to someone that's not in the office today, I can export the data and then easily email that information to someone else within the organization. Let's take a look at stop number two, the normalization of that data that's just been discovered. Once again, it's presented to you via a dashboard view. With out-of-the-box widgets, just as we saw before, all these widgets within our dashboards are living entities. What does that mean? That means that I can go into any bar within any of my widgets and then click on that bar and get the detailed information sitting behind that bar. Once again, I can, re I can modify any of my widgets, resize them, remove them from my dashboard, and of course, export it once again. And once I do that normalization, I can filter it by maybe five, top five, 10, top 10, top 15. So great capabilities with the assist normalization capabilities. Now, once again, gather the information, discover it, feed it through the normalization engine, and then present it to your end users or managers in a dashboard view. But just like as before, I can also have what we call our list view. And then with the list view, I get that information more detailed by software name, product, vendor. I can change the type. Maybe I want to see my commercial licenses, my freeware, open source. I can filter all that information for me and we give you an install count and we don't stop there with assist I can click on the install count and actually get a list of all the devices that are running this one particular software next stop on the journey is the reconciliation Right. So with Assist, we give you the capability to pull in your license agreement data. We can pull in the purchase order information, the license definitions. We can bring that in from any external sources or better yet, build it right within Assist. So have a single consolidated solution to handle all of the above. When I run it through my reconciliation engine, I then get these dashboard views just like we saw before. But now we're focused on compliancy of my software and my contracts, the high level view that management really needs to have at their fingertips. The next layer to reconciling that data is what we saw before, right? A list view. Now I can have this list view presented to me by business units. Once again, I can filter it. Right now, I want to look at all the software that's non-compliant, and I can see the violations here. I also give you purchase information, overspending, and maybe any shortfalls. And on top of that, once again, these reports are live, so I can click into, let's say, use quantity, and I'll, I'll get a list of all the, all the devices that this software is installed on that are not compliant. And on top of that, with Assist, we'll give you the reason why they're not compliant. All available, once again, on that consolidated single solution. So the next stop on our journey is, of course, audit ready. 
I want to be audit ready for those vendors when they come knocking on my door. And how does the SIS perform that for me? With our compliance reporting capabilities. We give you a set of compliance reports right out of the box. In addition to that, we give you compliance reports for some of the major vendors out there, such as Adobe, Microsoft, and even Oracle. And I can take this compliance report and export it if I want to. So let's dive in. Let's take a look at the compliance summary report. What does that look like? Well, if I click on the summary compliance report, nice, clean, overall, overall view of all my compliance summary reports. And it lets me know at a glance, color-coded, what softwares are compliant, which ones are non-compliant, and it also gives me purchase information, used information, availability and more great information when it comes to being audit ready the final stop on our journey today is optimizing what you have now the beauty of assist is we also not only just do discovery but we also track utilization so when I'm tracking the software, I want to know not only is the software installed on someone's desktop, but is that user actually using that software? That's software metering. So with Assist, we give you, once again, a dashboard view of that information. But not only do I give you this information, but I give you the capability to take action. So if I look at my next view, available within Assist, I give you usage detailed information. So when I run my discovery, I can tell you all the nodes that are running something like Adobe. So I can set a filter here to show me a list of all that particular software name. So I'm looking at a list of all the servers that are running Adobe. But on top of that, Usage frequency. How often is this software actually being used by Bethany? Well, if we look down below, we have one particular user, Maya. And she's really not using that software that much. So she's a prime candidate to have the software uninstalled and provide that license to someone that actually needs the software and uses it. Which kind of goes to my next step. And the next step is uninstall, right? This is another example of optimizing what you have. So with Assist, we give you all this information, such as the software name for the unused software. Now I can just select the particular device that I want to run my uninstall on, and it's that easy. So we went through five steps for you today on how you can address vendor license audit. So what I'd like you to do is come to our website, get more information, and we'll provide you on how you can how you can address things like vendor license audits. Back to you, Alan. Fantastic, Ed. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I know we're moving really quickly towards the full completion of the hour. Um, there have been some questions come in, Ed, um, from the audience. Uh, I'm going to pick one. That, it was the kind of first one that came through, but it seems really relevant. So I hope you don't mind if, you can, if I can answer you one more question before we wrap up today. Would that be okay? Absolutely. Yeah, so this comes in. Um, uh, really great question. It's actually multiple questions, but it starts off, what kind of integrations do you support? Where does user info come from? Active, Direct Active Directory, for instance, and does Assist require its own discovery agents? Um, I don't know how you want to break that down, but maybe we start off at what kind of integrations do you support? I'm presuming with other um, discovery tools. Yes, yeah, so what we're able to do is we're able to pull in all this discovered information and then populate our CMDB. 
And once we populate that CMDB, now we can provide that information, all this discovered information, to the help desk organization. And if the user is using any other help desk, inf I'm sorry, any other discovery solutions, they can pull that information into our CMDB. So now not only do you have our discovery information, but you also have any third party discovery information. Cool. Okay, thank you very much for that. Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, no problem. <laughs> Uh, so that concludes the webinar um, for today. There are some unanswered questions on the chat window um, in the interest of obviously coming off the webinar and letting everybody get on with their day job. We will get back to everybody that's, uh, that's um, posted a question, um, myself, um, Ed, or Laura will personally get back to you and answer those questions. But I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you very much again for attending. There will be an on-demand version available um, and we'll include the link to the free SAM assessment tool um, and hopefully we can um, we can speak again. Thank you very much for all your time. Um, the webinar is now concluded. Thank you.